Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this episode of Just Another Year of Chicago. My name is Nick Brody. There is no training camp today, but I had the opportunity to have a very special guest on, Joaquin Iglesias, former Bears wide receiver, and today we are going to hit on the wide receiver room. Before we begin this episode, please hit the like button on this video, put your th comments in the comment section below, and hit that subscribe button to stay up to date on all news. Joaquin, welcome to the show. Excited to have you on. Hey, thanks, Nick. I appreciate you. I appreciate you having me on, and I'm excited to be on. Yeah, and I'm excited to have you on, but also to talk about the Bears. You know, the team that drafted you into the NFL back in 2009, you know, you got to experience, we were talking about it before the show, the cold of Soldier Field, just Chicago <laughs> and its brutal conditions. And I know you went to Minnesota for a couple years after, which was just as cold, if not colder. Right. But you're living the dream in Texas now. I'm happy that you're able to call in. And to start things off, uh, Joaquin, for this episode, you know, your first quarterback in the NFL was Jay Cutler, which is mm -hmm. a pretty cool experience. You know, he's a, he's a Chicago guy. Bears fans loved him. Unfortunately, didn't get to that one step. We were one game away from making it to the Super Bowl. Yeah. But in regards to Jay Cutler, what was the one thing that he did, did, whether it was at practice, during the game, or in the locker room, that drove you or drove your teammates crazy? Uh, well, I don't know about as far as teammates, but I know like the receivers. He threw that ball hard. And when you're in <laughs> cold weather and the ball is coming 100 miles an hour, I mean, it, it hurts. I mean, it gets there on time, but it's just, I mean, it hurts. So oh, man. it's funny, but it's, I mean, it, it's good. You want that. You want the ball there on time. And, you know, obviously he has a sh super strong arm, so it was good. But, man, it's, it's just over and over hitting those hands. It, it feels like a brick. You're catching bricks. Oh man, was would you say that Jay Cutler had one of the stronger arms of, of the quarterbacks you've worked with? Or who uh, would you say is your top three? Yeah, absolutely. So, I actually got a chance to – yeah, Jay Cutler's right up there. Um, I actually got a tra chance to train with Matthew Stafford. Um, I forget the place we trained at, but um, I trained with him, and then I trained – I was fortunate enough to train with um, one session with um, Colin Kaepernick, and they they wow. throw the ball. All three of them throw it extremely hard. <laughs> So did you did you have any opportunity with Brett Favre in Minnesota or was he gone by the time no, you No, he was no, he was gone before I was there. That would have been okay. pretty cool, but yeah, that I was I was gone. So who who was your quarterback then in Minnesota? Was it Jackson or who was it back then? No, it was Christian Ponder. That was like his oh. first year. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so mm -hmm. he was not up in that hard throwing list. It was no, uh, not, Cutler not and like that. No, no, no. Yeah. That yeah. Him, color, oh, Matt, Matt Stafford, yes, they, they throw pretty hard. So, you know, a lot of wide receivers have said that, you know, Justin Fields' progression has gotten crazy talk, going into the camp. And, you know, I had the fortunate opportunity to go up there and to House Hall and kind of see what they're doing. And, you know, Fields' arm looks incredible. So mm -hmm. there's a ton of footage of him out there, you know, especially him and new wide receiver one, DJ Moore. And they're working really well. Being a former wide receiver in the NFL, what do you see and what is so important that fans need to know when it comes to a QB1 and wide receiver one relationship? And what do you see between Fields and Moore that's going to be special? The biggest thing on any relationship, whether it's the top guy all the way down to the last guy on the totem pole, is chemistry. It's you have to be in the same system. You have to be around the guy. You have to be able to think and, and communicate without even speaking. That is the biggest thing. It's, it's knowing that he knows you're going to be in certain places and you know that the, that he's going to throw the ball in certain places without even talking. I mean, right. Cause your stuff is moving a hundred miles an hour. People are flying by. I mean, you have to make adjustments on the fly and the more and more you can get, be in that system, be in those situations um, with the quarterback, it's just the it gets easier and easier and easier and that is the biggest thing it's just being comfortable with each other and within a system together and that's something that we've seen so far i mean i'm not sure if you had the opportunity to see the fields and dj Moore interview that happened this past weekend but 
you know, they're chopping it up. They're laughing. They're already saying how like they feel the brotherhood off the field and on the field. So to, you know, to hear that and hear it from you who had that experience in the NFL and how fast the game is too, compared to, you know, college to NFL, that's always huge. And if you were to say one thing to fans that they need to be patient about for a first year duo, what, I mean, besides within the chemistry, whether that be communication, like you were saying, or kind of the overall speed of the game, what is one thing that fans need to understand that's much harder to do than say from a wide receiver quarterback relationship? Yeah, it, it, it goes right back to just being in, being able to communicate without communicating, being able to understand where I'm going to be, being understand what he's thinking in his mind on when he sees the coverages and re, is reading coverages from the quarterback per, perspective as well as from the receiver perspective. Because, again, a lot of this stuff is going 100 miles an hour, right? And it's it's one thing to do um, like they were yesterday in training camp. It's like one thing to do in practice and having it in front of you in practice. But then it's a whole nother ball game when it's referees, it's thousands and thousands of fans, it's, you know, it's stressful situation. That is something that the fans have to be patient with that yes, they are getting gaining that brotherhood. Yes, they're gonna get better, but it's nothing like in-game, real live experience to be able to do that together. And that just takes time. So be patient, but they they are a great duo. They'll be great. And the more and more that they're around each other and enjoy each other, the better it will be for everybody. So speaking of patience, you you left me a total layup for uh, my next question in regards to, you know, the wide receiver relationship is Chase Claypool, a guy that was traded to the Chicago Bears last year, midseason, mm-hmm. hoping to be that next guy for Justin Fields because DJ Moore wasn't even a thought during week eight of last year. And Chase Claypool wasn't off to the best start with the Bears, you know, didn't really have the stats that people were hoping for. He didn't get up to speed with the playbook. And that's something that is super hard for a guy to do to come into a whole new system halfway through the season, new quarterback, new line, new fan base, new field. I mean, every little factor went into play, but what are your thoughts on Claypool so far? He's having a pretty big bounce back training camp so far, had a lot of nice touchdowns on Tuesday uh, from Justin Fields, you know, to the open public. And, you know, where do you see him impacting the offense the most? Uh, well, I, I mean, just from his previous years, right? I mean, he's a dynamic player. He He's a playmaker. Like He can make those big splash plays. He can get you the the, the hard and dirty, um, you know, catches as well. He's a big guy. So, but again, I think what people don't understand is it, it, it just takes time. Like, especially with a guy like that who comes from a different – system comes from a different city comes from a different you know different norm right i mean it's it's hard you got to think yes they are fully immersed in football but they also have lives too right they they, he could be you know moving some of his family with them he can somebody can get stuck at an airport i mean it's it's all types of stuff going on right in in everyday day-to-day life just like everybody else so and it just takes time to adjust so yeah he, he wasn't off to the best start but like anything else, I mean, it, it takes a little time. Let him get comfortable. Let him go through, you know, training camp. Let him get around the guys. Let him get, you know, acclimated with the city, you know, in general. And and it, all that stuff will, will, you know, continue to work out. But obviously he's a heck of a player, and he'll make plays. And, you know, between those three guys, I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll be fun to watch. And, you know, he's by far the tallest wide receiver out of everybody. You know, he stands at 6'4", a little over 230. But he, like you were saying, he's an incredible player, great athlete. And he's the guy that's going to be the big red zone target besides Cole Komet for the Bears next year. Can you kind of break down, you know, yourself? You were a pretty big wide receiver uh, when you were playing back in the day for the Bears. You were a big target for Cutler. What is what is it like to be known as the big target? You know, is there a certain pressure that's on your shoulder that Claypool is feeling, you, you know, especially in the red zone? And also, what's it like to be in the red zone, being the red zone wide receiver? And how hard is it to actually make a play? Yeah, well, to start, I'm, I'm going to start at the end with what you said. Yeah, I mean, in the red zone, it's always tough because it's it, it just happens a lot faster, right? The, the field is condensed, so you put 22 people – 
within 30 yards, I mean, I mean, it, it, it happens really, really quick. And everybody's fast out there, defensive line, offensive line, you know, everybody is fast, athletic. So it just happens a lot quicker. But, yes, as a receiver, if you're a jump ball guy, that's the best. You can't wait to get to the red zone. And especially, like, DBs are normally smaller. So um, although they're super fast and, and super quick, at the end of the day, if I'm taller than you and you're shorter than me and I and we can both jump the same, I'm still coming down with the ball. So it doesn't – so, I mean, I'm just bigger than you. I'm naturally bigger than you. So it, it, it's, it's fun to get down there and everybody wants to score touchdowns, right? I mean, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it is – it, it, it is fun, but also when you're across the middle, in the middle of the field, it's not so fun when you're a bigger target because <laughs> then it's easier to get hit around. So it has its it, it's, it's uh, positives and negatives, just like anything else. But, yeah, so we'll see. Taking a blast to the pass real quick. It's funny because, you know, talking about hard hitting in the middle of the field, you had to practice at training camp with some pretty tough defenses. You know, you had Erlocker, Briggs, Tommy Harris, you know, Alex Brown, all these big name guys on the yeah. other side of the ball that you had to deal with on a daily basis at practice. And, you know, kind of going through that, the Bears have a very young and talented defense right now. They're fast, they're big, and they're starting to shape up into being one of the better units in the NFL. Going back down memory lane, who was the hardest hitter on that Bears defense that you had to deal with at practice? Oh, I mean, <laughs> like you just just named four guys, but I was there when Julius Peppers was there. Uh, Anthony Adams, <laughs> like all these guys are – you talking about being big, all of those guys are bigger than me. So, it, I mean, that, I mean, it's, it's tough to go in there. I mean, it's, I mean, and, and, and especially being a young receiver and you line up against some of these dudes and you're like, man, this is a tall task, but, <laughs> but I got to get it done. But one thing I can always go back and I always think about this is I believe it was Mike Marks was there and he always had this play where we had to crack down on the defensive end. Well, being one of the bigger receivers, that's one of the disadvantages. It's like, hey, go in there and crack down. And I remember over and over in practice, we used to have to do it, and it was uh, Julius Peppers every time. And I'll line up, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, this is not going to feel good. And it would be okay if he didn't see you coming, but, you know, he's Julius Peppers, a Hall of Fame guy. So he's going to see you coming sometimes, and then he's going to turn around, and he's going to give it to you. So. I would say Julius Peppers by far. It just the size of that human being and how he could run and move. I mean, was I mean, you had to see it to believe it. Did you did you feel like practicing with those guys made you better though? Was there like a, even though it hurt, like did it make you a better player overall at the end of the day and prepared for games? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was one of the best defense defenses, you know, in the league and Anytime you can go against the guys like that, and even Peanut Tillman, and you know, I mean, all those guys, Vasher, I mean, they were, they're fast, they're good, they're proven vets. So anytime you can go against that, it, it, it's going to do you well. So was going to ask you that because the Bears currently have a guy named Terrell Smith that they took out of Minnesota this past year in the, in the mm -hmm. fifth round, and he is already running with the ones, kind of shocking a lot of people, and he is a big DB. So you kind of hit on earlier, like, you know, in regards to what it's like to be against, because DBs are usually smaller. They're usually about six foot, you know, or under, but not Terrell Smith. Terrell Smith is a big DB. In when you go up against a bigger DB, what type of challenge, is there an advantage? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of that? Because you have to think of a whole new game plan. And how did you handle that situation? Yeah, I mean, the bigger DBs, I mean, because – I'm, I'm a receiver, right? So DBs, they hold every single play. So if if it, if they have longer arms and they're stronger and bigger, then it just makes your job even tougher. So that was one of the disadvantages. I mean, huge disadvantages, but they typically aren't, you know, your little fast, typical cornerbacks. So they do move a little slower. They do mo move a little different. Um but I mean, they're big and fast and strong where, where they make up for some of their, you know, lack of quickness. So, yeah, I mean, e either way, <clears throat> when you get to that level, there's really no good <laughs> DB that you want to go against because either they're super fast and you can't get past them or they're super, you know, big and aggressive. And then it's a tough day either way. So, 
um, yeah, I mean, it's really not a bad thing to be able to be long and big with I mean, strong arms and stuff like that. So, and you know, it's, and gotta ask because you've had personal experience. Not a lot of people can say that, but was Charles Tillman like seriously the peanut punch? Like, is that? How hard did he actually punch the football? During yeah, the game it's just – and it's funny now because everybody does it now. But yeah. back then, it's just so unexpected. Like, nobody did it. Like, it, it was it was such a surreal thing to see somebody come up and then you wouldn't even see his hand sometime and he'll punch it out. And you just didn't even see what happened, but you knew you weren't carrying the ball anymore. So – but it, but you adapt to it quick. And to go back to your other question – it's like, did that make you better? App, stuff like that, absolutely, because you just aren't expecting it. But when you see it over and over and over, then when you get into the games, then you know you're ready for you're ready for anything. So, uh, yeah, but it, it it that was one of those things where you never got used to it. But it's, I mean, it, it was tough. Man, I bet. I mean, I I'm happy. I never got to deal with it when I was playing football because I'm sure. Even if he missed the ball and he punched you, probably didn't feel too good because right. Tillman's a pretty big guy. Right, <laughs> he's a big guy. Right, right, yeah. So either either one, either way, he won. That's a, that's how he <laughs> went into that. I'm sure. So going back to the offense, you know, Mike Martz was your offensive coordinator, and there was a there was a few questionable things that he said. You know, him and Cutler didn't have the greatest relationship. It was kind of caught on camera a few times of. Cutler practically ignoring Mike Martz. You know, what was it like when Cutler was in the huddle with you and handling that? Because Fields and Getze have a fantastic relationship from, you know, from what we see at practice and what we see publicly. But behind closed doors, sometimes that's not the case. So in the huddle, how did Cutler kind of handle those situations? And, you know, did you guys have any sort of influence or do you guys just, if Jay called it, Jay called it and we're going out with it? Yeah, I mean, any guy who plays to that level um, at quarterback, whether it's – I mean, even in college, you see it in college too, and especially the elite guys in, in the NFL. I mean, they're going to make checks and they're going to think, you know, that different stuff. I mean, they're 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 smart guys too. They know the game. They're looking at the game um, and, and from a way different perspective than a coach, you know, in a press box or on the sideline. So um, it's always going to be those tense moments, and it's just always funny that – when it does get caught on camera, you know, it's a huge deal. But those moments happen, I mean, every single play. Somebody's upset about something. Somebody, you know, did wrong, went the wrong way. So it's not really that big of a deal to guys in the, in, in the huddle because um, we're all just going to war together. So we're it's one common goal, um, one common focus. So I never really looked at any of that stuff in a negative light. Yeah. I mean, because it's hard to go against somebody and be banging against – people and trying to run and they hitting you and you're trying to hit them and everybody be, you know, holding hands and sit, having a sing along, you know, it's going to be some, <laughs> tense, it's going to be some tense moments. So two more questions for you, Joaquin, before we call it um, an episode. And I'm really appreciative of you coming on, but a lot of people don't know the wide receiver to offensive line relationship, you know, two different types of players, completely mm -hmm. different roles. But at the same time, you see them having really good relationships, especially on celebrations in the end zone. So out of the Bears offensive linemen during your time with Chicago, who was the guy that everyone just like, that guy has your back? I mean, all of them do. But who, I mean, Owen Crude seems like the answer. I feel like that's going to be your answer. But who's the guy that you were closest with on the offensive line? Oh, no, nah, by far, my guy was Lance Lewis, by far. Lance Lewis, that's a yeah. name I haven't heard in a long time. Yeah, man. that was my guy. We would room together on the road. We would hang out together. I don't know, for whatever reason, I think because he was from Louisiana, and my mom and her side of the family is all from Louisiana, so we had that connection. But for whatever reason, man, we always hung out. He would always come over. We would hang out together at my house, just me and him, and we would, you know, go shop together. We did everything together, and – so that was, that was my guy. Man, Lance Lewis. I remember Lance Lewis. Like the second you said it, I was like, that like a core memory was unlocked. I remember him from those Bears teams. Oh, yeah. I thought he was a great lineman for the time he was there. Great, great guy. Maybe we'll have him on the show, you two together one time to re-chop yeah. it up, 
down memory yes. lane. That would be cool, man. I haven't talked to him in a long time, but that was my guy. Um, yeah, we had, we had some some cool some cool days together. Well, this is your excuse to reach out to him. So hopefully right, you guys right. do. Maybe we can get that going. But, you know, uh, one more question for you before we close out. And, you know, thank you again. I, I know I know the listeners love to hear, you know, from former players and hear go down memory lane and also bring it back to, you know, today's day and age. And today's day and age, the Bears still don't have a 4,000-yard passer. And Eric Kramer was the closest it got. Cutler got pretty close a few times. But Justin Fields looks like the guy with the room that he has right now. With the guys that Fields has in front of him, do you think Fields can reach that 4,000-yard passing uh, in a single season this year? Yeah, I think if anybody can, he can, especially with the way the NFL is now. I mean, it's it's fast-paced. You're throwing the ball all over the place. Um, you get big yards really, really quick. Um, you know, you have the – indoor stadiums now i mean it's it's set up for offenses nowadays um but it is still chicago you're still gonna run it's still gonna be freezing outside <laughs> so that is <laughs> that is one of the challenges because you could be putting up a bunch of numbers in the beginning of the year but then when you get to those cold games it's just hard to throw the ball around with the wind swirling i mean and you know Sometimes it's snow, you know, it, it's just ugly weather, right, sometimes. So that is some of the challenge. But I think if anybody could do it, he can. I mean, he's I mean, he's dynamic both with his arm and his leg. So it, it'll, it'll be fun to watch. Man, well, I wish Justin Fields was your quarterback at one point because that would have been electric to see as well. But you never know. Well, maybe we'll have you back up at Hallis Hall and they'll do an alumni game or something uh, <laughs> yeah. to give you that opportunity. But – and Joaquin, if you were to say that this bear that this Bears team, you know, this Bears team is talented. They're young. They're fast. Do you think this Bears team is making the playoffs this year? Um, yeah, I think they have a run. I, and I think it's funny, like when guys like uh, like Aaron Rodgers leaves, it kind of gives everybody like, oh, this is we have a chance. Like we can do it. I mean, because he had such a stronghold on the um, on the division for a while, so. And that that mental state, I mean, that the mental part of the game is just as important. So, and they were a good team. I mean, the Bears are a good team. Um, so they have that, and maybe you know, not as kind of opened up. You have another young quarterback there. Um, I could easily see them making the playoffs, sure. And I know you played for Minnesota too, so you know it's it's you. Kirk Cousins is still around. You know, Justin Jefferson is still around. So there's still that opportunity, but you know, from the NFC North standpoint, that's where you played your career in. And it's going to be fun to watch those two guys. So I'm sure you're going to be kind of divided on when you're watching games, especially oh, between those. Two. Oh no, I'm Chicago all day long. They gave me my shot in the NFL. So I'm, I'm riding with Chicago all day long. That's what we love to hear, man. I appreciate, and I appreciate you saying that. Uh, uh, Joaquin, if you could stay on for a second after we're done recording, that'd be great. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much for joining this episode, man. It's great getting to know you. Great hearing your experiences with the Bears and what you're seeing for this upcoming team. And can't wait to have you on again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Nick. I appreciate it. And I appreciate all y'all fans out there throughout my time there. The be Some of the best fans in the world. Um, and wish, you know, this season goes well. And good luck to the Bears. Absolutely. Jo Joaquin Iglesias, former wide receiver for the Chicago Bears, is on our episode. Excited to ha have had him on. We're going to have him on again soon. But with that, thank you very much for joining this episode of Just Another Year Chicago. My name is Nick Rohde, and we'll see you guys.